You know, Jeff, it's funny. You're not a lawyer, but I think you just gave a classic lawyer's answer, which is it depends, <laughs> right? <laughs> that, that's right. Right. You know, we're it, trying to do that. We're trying to say that uh, because the the valuation assumptions, the the attributes, and in, in the importance of understanding the premise of value is is critical. Uh, and we often say that it depends. We always have to study what the the situations are. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to A Higher Law, a cannabis podcast from the Dykema Law Firm. I'm Brett Gelbord, Senior Counsel in Dykema's Labor and Employment Group, and I'll be your host today. For more episodes, you can find us at youtube.com slash dykemalaw, dykemapodcast.com, or by searching A Higher Law wherever you get your podcasts. And Dykema is spelled D-Y-K-E-M-A. If you've heard my previous episodes, you may be expecting an employment-related conversation, but today we're going to mix things up a little bit. With me to talk about business valuation and litigation and distressed operations is Jeff Bagalis of Acurity Group. Jeff is a CPA and forensic accountant who provides expert support in disputes on topics ranging from damages calculations to business valuations, among other things. Jeff, it's great to have you on today. Thank you, Brad. Thanks for having me today. It's, it's my pleasure. Um, I guess to get us started, can you give a quick explanation uh, about what it exactly is you do as a forensic accountant and how your services fit into the cannabis industry? Absolutely. Well, first of all, uh, just a little background about myself. I'm a managing director at Acurity Group. Uh, Acurity Group is a financial consulting and dispute advisory firm that provides expert witness testimony in the realm of any type of dispute, uh, as well as uh, services involving business valuations and forensics, uh, all of the above our firm covers within the space, including the cannabis industry. Okay, um, so so when someone approaches you or your colleagues for help with something, is it typically an attorney who's approaching you or would it be a business owner? It could be either or. You know. It, it, for example, either party could could approach our firm uh, and, and ask or inquire about various elements of economic damages or business valuation issues in the context of any type of dispute or resolution involving the trier of fact or some type of arbitrator or person involved determining economic damages in any type of dispute. Okay. And I guess when we're talking about um, business valuations it might be useful for everyone if we backed up a second here. Um, the the context in which your services might be needed usually, at least in my experience in working with you, come about because shareholders of a corporation or members of an LLC who have been owning and operating a business together for some period of time have reached a point in that relationship where they are parting ways. And whether that is because a dispute has arisen uh, and it's become litigious, or maybe someone just wants to retire and is ready to be bought out and have their shares bought out. When something like that happens, the ownership, uh, their ownership interest in the business needs to have a value put on it so that the, the party that's going to be staying with the business can figure out how much to pay in order to buy out the partner that's leaving. Is that about kind of sum it That's up? That's correct. That any type of dispute involving the question of value related to a shareholder interest in the business or the impact of a diversion of a corporate opportunity or any type of various breaches or claims that follow with any type of impact of economic damages uh, is typically when my firm or myself would get a call from either individuals or companies that are looking for guidance in those areas in dispute. Okay. And I guess anyone who's watching the news, at least in Michigan and probably in several other states have, have come to the, uh, come to appreciate the fact that the cannabis industry, like many others is not immune to downturns in the economy and disputes uh, among, among business owners. And so I know right now in Michigan, we're seeing a lot of distressed companies. There's been several high profile receiverships um, and there's a good amount of 
shareholder and member litigation that's happening right now. And just like in other industries, the, I think the, the outcome of those situations is that, like we just discussed, one or more parties are going to be either forced out or voluntarily leaving uh, the ownership structure of these businesses. And so uh, your services help them figure out how, um, how to value that. And, and maybe you can talk about, I guess, A, the general process for figuring out what the value is in, in a situation where there's a lawsuit pending or a business is somehow, you know, facing some sort of, yes. you know, distress. Um, and then maybe why that's different in the cannabis space as opposed to some other industries that, that I know you work That's in. a great question. And so, you know, as you kind of touched on, the cannabis industry has evolved, you know, significantly over the last, you know, couple of years. We've it's been covered greatly, you know, with pricing pressures changing, various economics normalizing after the recall in the past, you know, impacting the industry. You have all these different factors coming in, which then causes uh, questions from, from parties and, and businesses about those issues you just mentioned. When you have various equity shareholders questioning now with the changes in the economics, the business climate of how that impacts shareholder value. These questions now come up when the economics change, such as the cannabis industry recently. That would trigger uh, questions about profitability and its impact around shareholder value, as well as the cost to contribute as an investor or a business to maintain sufficient cash flow and continue as a going concern. When those things change, parties question, our firm comes in and has to sort out a variety of factors to determine what claims or elements impact shareholder value or future profits to the business and the return to those profits to the shareholders. Uh, when those factors change, people often wonder how that impacts their components, their profitability, their return, and of course, we help sort those things out. And Brett, as you said, those value questions and impact to damages are different based on the claims between the parties, whether it's for a shareholder issue or for it's a buyout or exit as a participating equity shareholder or a, debt, a debtor involved in the business. So there's a variety of issues that can come up. Uh, which I have seen recently because of all the different changes in the industry that we are experiencing now in Michigan currently. Okay. I guess there's, there's some stuff in there that I think is probably worth unpacking. Um, I guess first you mentioned the recall. And I think for, for our uh, listeners who aren't uh, in Michigan uh, or who maybe who are newer to the, to the market here in Michigan, I think you're referring to the Veritas Labs recall from, it must have been November 2021. Um, something that, like that. That's correct. Yeah. yeah. In November, approximately is when that recall impacted the, the supply chain pricing. Of course, it's one of the major factors within the industry here in Michigan that, that caused a, 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 a sizable change in reaction to the parties participating in the industry, which then caused these questions of value and future profits related to the current economics that we see now in the industry. That's correct. Right. Yeah, and I don't want to hold you to specific numbers because I certainly don't remember the numbers, but I do recall it being a, a massive, massive like percentage of product was pulled off of the shelves by the by the state regulator by the state regulator. That's that's right. It's significantly impacted the players. Uh, the reaction to the the pricing dramatically decreased. It's it's been documented well, uh, and and the struggles of participators businesses, individuals, investors in the industry have all had to react with the changing economic factors. Uh, and it also always comes down to the question of shareholder value and future profitability. Uh, and again, like you said, the recall clearly triggered one of those reactions in the industry, which then is causing these questions currently on the impact of shareholder value and future profitability, absolutely. And I guess then to kind of focus on what we're talking about when we talk about share, shareholder value and buyouts and that kind of a thing, you know, I, I, I think there's, I'm dealing with a, with a matter now, not in the cannabis industry, 
um, that's a that's a business divorce, and the the parties have you know worked for a long time uh, to build this business, and they're good at what they do. Um, but I think there's a misunderstanding about how this business valuation process works and how you get at what the value is of a business for the purposes of a buyout. And I've been having conversations uh, about, you know, well, well, why can't we just tally up everything that the business owns? The assets are worth a million dollars. The real estate is worth a million dollars. We have, uh, you know, uh, co contracts worth $3 million. And so you add that up, it's $5 million. The other guy gets half and then we're done. Like, how come it's not that simple? That's right. Uh, that's a great question. I get a, a lot when, when asked about shareholder value in a variety of scenarios. Um, when we're asked these questions, you know, the first area we look at is, are we working with counsel to determine a formulaic buyout and an agreement, which that potentially may define a different value proposition. Uh, and so, Brett, you ask, a, a, you bring up a great issue. If we're determining shareholder value based on an agreement, uh, it may be agnostic to the current economic factors to determine the fair market value. And then secondly, when you're looking at shareholder value, if you're valuing the entire enterprise versus a percentage interest that may have different rights or control rights or various elements to impact the profitability or decision-making, you then have to discuss and analyze the impact of discounts for marketability, lack of control, illiquidity and these other elements that as a valuation practitioner we need to be aware of when answering questions of shareholder value so in summary it depends on if we're looking for a contract for a buyout that's formulaic they might be arriving at a different basis such as book value or just a net asset value calculation whereas in a, in a fair market value scenario we may be asked to look at the specifics of a unique ownership interest that may be of, uh, of a different type of ownership structure, we have to recognize the actual fair market value and those discounts that we recognize in the marketplace. And within the cannabis industry, there are specifics that drive up that discount and that may also impact that shareholder value that are unique as opposed to other businesses like you just mentioned, maybe in a different scenario like family law. You know, Jeff, it's funny. You're not a lawyer, but I think you just gave a classic lawyer's answer, which is it depends, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, that's right, right. You know, we're it, trained to do that. We're trained to say that uh, because the the valuation assumptions, the the attributes, and in, in the importance of understanding the premise of value is is critical. Uh, and we often say that it depends. We always have to study what the the situations are. You're right. So I'll give, I guess, two concrete examples and, and then maybe we can talk about how they're different and why, you know, a discount might be applied here versus there. So if you have, let's say, a 50-50 uh, uh, ownership structure in an LLC with two members who have equal voting rights and they're controlling the company um, and, and uh, you know, there's a dispute and one of them wants to buy the other one out, you've got to figure out the 50% value for one of those, uh, you know, one of those members versus a situation where you have maybe multiple members in an LLC and someone has been given 10%, 15% ownership with no voting rights. Um, and, and there's been a dispute with that person and they need to be pushed out. So, so that strikes me, I think is a situation where that 10% person, there might be a discount on it. Once you figure out, let's say the business is worth a million dollars, they're not going to get, a value that says, oh, your 10% is worth 10% of a million dollars. It's going to be discounted because they don't have any control. Is that am you're, I... you're right. You're, you're touching on one of the elements that that are relevant to determine shareholder value. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, you're always going to look at future profitability with an ownership interest and the ability to effectuate the profitability and determine distributions to a shareholder. Those are two major elements that figure into whether or not a discount would apply to determine 
fair market value or some other basis of value within an engagement, uh, especially if it's a minority interest or less than an 100% interest where the ownership rights are limited that impact the future distributions or profitability of that ownership interest. And whether it's a cannabis industry or any other industry, that exercise is the same. However, within the cannabis industry, with some of the limitations that exist currently, there are other elements that may impact the shareholder value to look at when determining those elements uh, of a minority interest or any interest at a fair market value basis. And I guess not to jump around too much, but something that I that I'm curious about is I know when when we first met, we worked on a kind of a messy business divorce uh, in the medical space. And I remember you looking at comparable businesses to try and figure out, uh, you know, what the value might be for, for the client in that space. And I think you looked at some historical data going back however many years to figure out, you know, in this location, what is this kind of medical practice generate in terms of revenue and what were they sold for and this kind of a thing. Now, in the cannabis space, that's, I think, harder to do because you only have, I guess, a very limited set of data in terms of that look back. So is there like a counterweight that you can throw in there to, to adjust for that? Or how do you how do you handle that sort of lack of information? Great question. You know, if we were sitting here looking at shareholder value in 2020, versus even 2023, it depends, our favorite answer. However, <laughs> uh, one thing's for certain, uh, in a mature industry, which I, you know, some individuals may classify now the Michigan cannabis industry transitioning, but regardless, it's still in its infancy stages. So therefore, pointing to historical financial results and simply saying that that's what the future expectation is in an industry that's rapidly changing for recalls, increasing demand, uh, you know, inability to access debt and, and equity financing, all these other elements that are, are incremental or, or additional challenges to this industry, you know, certainly are, are unique that have to be considered when looking at shareholder value. Is, is there any utility in looking at some of the more mature cannabis markets yeah. for, for comparables like California, or Oregon, or are the conditions too different? Great. You know, good question. But to follow up, because of all those changes, how do you counteract reliance on something that, that isn't indicative of the current economic situation in, in, in evaluation? Uh, That's a good point. You, you can look at more recent period of time and capitalize the cash flows. Or you may, like you said, uh, which is essentially truncates the historical period to look at to account for more recent economic events. Uh, or you may discreetly project what you believe to be the profitability or not in a discrete period of time and do a discounted cash flow method to account for the specifics of the company's projections or the return of the minority interest or the interest you're valuing. So there are specific steps within the income approach to identify the profitability of the ownership interest. You also can look to the transaction approach, which you mentioned, uh, which also can give you a guideline of, of the current multiples to value that are trading in the open marketplace to help reconcile the value you're determining off the income. So that also helps you. And in an industry like the cannabis industry in Michigan, looking at historical results of profitability or pricing is less relevant than studying the current transactions, the specifics of those transactions of the indication of value in the open marketplace, and then correlating it back to your ownership interest. That's how you counteract uh, you know, things in the past that aren't relevant to the future profitability or anything in the past that has nothing to do with what everyone in the industry believes is going to happen going forward, impacting profits and shareholder returns. Hmm. Now, we've, we've been talking, you mentioned a couple of times, you know, whether it's uh, evaluation is being done pursuant to an agreement or not. And uh, 
I'm guessing you're referring to some sort of shareholder agreement or an operating agreement for an LLC that lays out a valuation process and a dispute resolution process. And um, I, I mean, I guess and this is a this is I guess something of an aside, but I, I guess I would say that you know, as an attorney working in in the business dispute resolution for you know ten years now or more, um, I think that having detailed um, detailed steps in those types of agreements and having those agreements in place in the first place, because I, I'm always shocked when I have a, a, come across a client who has a business and there's no operating agreement or there's no shareholder agreement. So first step, this is just, I think, some best practices for your business operations. Have have an operating agreement that's that's been drafted by an attorney who knows the industry that you're in uh, or a shareholder agreement. And within it, make sure that there is some sort of dispute resolution and buy out, buy sell process, because if not, it makes, I think, Jeff's job a lot harder, which means it makes it more expensive for you as a business yeah. owner. <laughs> you're, you're right, Brad. And I, I think it's important to point this out because uh, I'm getting calls recently from various class shareholders within this industry. And the first thing they ask me is, why am I not getting my return? Why am I not getting my profits? What is my interest worth today? And you're right. The first thing I ask is, is there an agreement determining the value? Is there some type of buyout or some type of formula? And to your point, with especially within this industry, if there's nothing in there, I mean, you're, you're subject to interpretation by the parties or someone like me. Uh, and to really hit the point home, Perhaps the buyout is hitting the net asset value. The shareholders intended to have a buyout under one basis. But if that's not defined, and suddenly I'm looking at the fair market value, which would account for all the, I'll say, hypothetical buyers and sellers out there, which are looking at the actual rights of a shareholder interest, if they were to compare it to the open market, uh, that fair market value could be dramatically less or different. And so as a shareholder, when you're asking about that, to your point, if there's no agreement at all, you're kind of wide open and you're kind of hitting the, you know, the bell as in, you know what, I just want to value my interest on the open market under fair market value, which then brings in discounts and it brings in a variety of factors that perhaps aren't necessary to determine a buyout for whatever the purpose is. So that's a great question, Brett. I see that a lot especially with some of the B or C shareholders within this industry recently. Okay. That makes sense. And I guess that touches on a good, maybe just a little fact or a, a bit of information that's useful for people. You talked about the fair market value version, and then it was the net, um, asset, net asset, asset version. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And so uh, it sounds like if you're, if you're in the position of a person who is trying to be bought out, and maximize your share, you want that net asset treatment? Well, again, you know, it's a great, great point here because we're talking about an industry where pricing has changed. Supply has changed. The you know players have reacted to margins and, and cost structure, revenue to, to cover their contribution on, on changing prices in the wholesale market, all these things. You know, when all those things come into play, that dramatically impacts the value on a going concern basis. And so now suddenly when pricing has, you know, at times dropped 40, 50%, whatever it was from the highs, maybe on a cash flow basis, that interest or business is not generating positive cash flow. And one now has to look at a liquidation value and at the balance sheet. And that's what I'm talking about, net asset value. Assets. Hmm not on a going concern basis may have more value than how they're currently used in the current operations in state. So if you don't have that in your agreement, you may be losing out on the true liquidation value of assets in the business and the minority shareholder or the shareholder looking to get bought out uh, may be subject to fair market value and significant discounts or under a different premise, which would depress the true value of the situation you're engaged to determine the, the value of the interest. So that, that would be exactly okay. why it's extremely important, especially within this industry, let alone any industry, uh, at least from my standpoint as an expert, when asked these questions in, in litigation. All right. Um, 
I think there were a couple of things that, that we talked about offline that, that are probably worth raising. And um, one of the things is the way that the um, 280E tax situation impacts uh, the work that you do in terms of assessing values. Is that something you want to kick yeah, around that, a little bit? That, that's right. Um, you know, we talk about, again, the concept of risk, you know, future cash flows, uh, which drives shareholder value if you're on a going concern basis. Uh, you know, so it's extremely important when looking at shareholder value if you have a, a, an operation potentially where the accounting, all the systems and everything in place aren't compliant with what's necessary to even qualify for a cost of goods sold or a proper deduction off the tax returns. One could be operating the business file a tax return, federal tax return, and later find out half the deductions aren't compliant with an appropriate deduction against revenue. And because of that, even if you do everything right, uh, you're gonna experience a higher tax rate in this industry, which would impact your return. But secondly, uh, you're also subject to more scrutiny, which could result in the inability to even deduct proper cost of goods sold because the process in which you accounted for it may not be eligible under the current code. So there's a lot of additional risk. It's something that I see within this industry and in the clients I'm working with where it's not thought about a lot, but it's certainly when looking at the return that a shareholder would expect from a business, you have to account for your effective tax rate and the differences uh, here with 280 in place within the cannabis industry. It is definitely something to talk about as it relates to shareholder return and the tax burden um, and the additional risks associated with operating, even to be eligible to get what's allowable as a deduction. So if we go back to our, our example earlier of the, of the member who's got a 10%, 15% interest and, and no voting rights, so he's gonna already have a, or she is already gonna have a depressed uh, buyout price, the, the tax treatment is something that's going to potentially push that price even further down. Whereas in another industry, if it was just, you know, a, a, a Starbucks franchise or whatever it is, um, I don't even know if Starbucks franchises, yeah. but, you know, if it's just a typical industry where somebody's got um, uh, an operating business that's not subject to the sort of punitive 280E uh, treatment, there's going to be a disparity yeah, a there. Absolutely. Uh, you know, just from looking, other players that, that aren't subject to 280E, you know, may have a, a, a tax burden at 20 I've seen things and I've, I've seen it firsthand, you know, effective tax rates to the individual after accounting for everything could be up to 80%. So if you're looking at shareholder value, Brad, I don't know how that wouldn't come into play in determining future profitability of your interest or, or frankly, you're all in profits after taxes from that, that ownership interest. I mean, yeah. that, that is significant uh, and it will continue to be. And I believe a risk, operating risk as a business when trying to get the proper deduction, uh, it cannot be ignored that you may not get it, even if you think you did, which would impact obviously your return and profits. Right. Wow. I wonder if, you know, if you've seen, I haven't seen this specific issue come up, but I wonder if you've seen a situation where someone's considering, you know, insisting on being bought out. They realize that there's this this negative tax treatment, and that um, and that they're going to have it, you know, their value discounted even further because of the negative tax treatment. You know, if there is any incentive to kind of look down the look down the pike a little bit and say. Um, you know, Congress might do something on this tax issue. I think there's another version of the SAFE Act pending right now. I'm not sure if it covers that or not. But if that issue is alleviated, then this um, this discount pressure kind of it, goes it, away. It could. You know, uh, again, it depends on a, an agreement. You know, maybe there's an operating agreement where mm -hmm. the member is entitled for distributions for taxes. So that would be, of mm -hmm. course, an, an expense somewhere. 
that, that comes into the equation, whether the business is incurring that on behalf of the shareholders or the shareholder themselves when determining their whether they're going to buy an interest or even participate as an equity or any type of player within the industry investor. Uh, you know, it, it, it has to be accounted for. Uh, and, and I have not seen that all the way through litigation. It has come up in the context of what a shareholder is entitled to from the business, which would include their right to get distributions for taxes. And of course, if you think your effective tax rate is significantly less than what it actually is, that's going to impact uh, damages to individuals flowing from any interest that you're asked to evaluate from a valuation standpoint or from damages. Hmm. All right. And I guess, I guess another thing that, um, can have this negative impact on evaluation that, that we that we also discussed is access to working capital. So I guess that's you know you're you're a business, uh, and as we all know, it can be challenging for for businesses in in the cannabis industry to get a revolving line of credit or whatever it, it is that would normally be available to you know more traditional industry operators. Um, and so that lack of access also can create an additional discounting factor when you're trying to figure out. Evaluation is that how it yeah, plays? Yeah, certainly. In? I mean, you're, if you're sitting and looking at a business, even if uh, you know you're looking at a set of financial statements and every you know someone put them together and they're perfect, they did a full valuation. Here it is. As a, as someone looking at that interest and determining the value, uh, the one of the questions I'm going to ask is, well, what is the mechanism which this business is, has access to capital, um, and any business should be concerned about that. But clearly in, within this industry, it's well known that the uh, players or individuals or parties, institutions that are willing to allow any type of access to capital, whether equity or debt, are extremely limited. Uh, so again, when you're looking at value, uh, you can look at the past breath and say, that's great, but perhaps that working capital vehicle, that, that institution, that individual investor, or the amount of available is gone. And so without that, uh, you're not gonna be able to bring in your receivables, your, your cash, everything to run the business uh, unless you have sufficient working capital. And uh, this is pretty obvious, but if profits are going down and costs are going up, the first area where Assets and, and value are depleted are, are working capital. Uh, you start taking from working capital, then you take it from wherever else. At least that's things that I've seen. So sitting here today, uh, it's one thing to just say, okay, that's great. That's the profits. That's maybe the net assets. Here's my value. But how are you going to take you know this machine that creates this expected profit and keep running it if you don't have access to any working capital, uh, which is a concern every business would have, especially within this industry. Well, it sounds like this is a pretty complicated issue and it's not as simple as just kind of splitting the pie in half and you take your half and I take mine and we can go our separate ways. If you don't do it right, you're going to wind up with just the crust or I don't know, whatever, however the metaphor goes. Uh, um, maybe a sheet um, of paper with a lot of rights and, and no, no assets or any cash flow or, or ability to control it or access it um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and just holding pieces of paper. Yeah, that's possible. Yeah. All right. Well, um, unless there's anything else that you'd like to specifically touch on today. I... No, that, that, that it's been an interesting yeah. topic. I love uh, talking about the, the factors that impact businesses and and this is a, a great topic uh very relevant obviously with with the michigan cannabis industry and the factors we're experiencing today um so happy to talk about it thank you for having me today i appreciate it it's been a pleasure jeff and it's always really uh great talking with you about these things you're super insightful and um that's it for us today thank you for listening as always you can find us at youtube.com slash law com or by searching a higher law wherever you get your podcasts. Once again, my name is Brett Gelbord, and we look forward to seeing you next time on a higher law.